truth, for power, for unity, resistance through media, resistance through art. We were told a year ago that the power is in our hands. What have we done with it? The reign of corporate control over our thoughts, over who we are, is over. Evolution is shaking the foundations of our capitalist culture and ending the commoditization of our thoughts. In order for art, for resistance, for freedom to reach the masses, we need no longer fear filtration and dilution at the hands of corporations and power-hungry CEOs. Take advantage of the tools in your hands. Discover the potential of freedom. Write music, make films, create art, and use cyberspace to reach as many people as possible. Tell those in power they are no longer needed. The medium is the message. The medium is the message, and the message is freedom. This doesn't mean it's easy. This doesn't mean no one died. But the government and the ruling class cannot survive our empowerment. The government can jail us. They can deny us our vote. They can try and deny our power. But when a million people no longer believe in that system, in their system, those in power shall tremble. A house divided cannot stand, and we will not be silenced. We no longer consent to their rule. We no longer believe there is no alternative. This message has been compromised, but remember, the time is now. The power is yours. Art is resistance. Hey yo, from the Kingdom of Ohio, this is O Culture, where we're live leaking the revolution with the distribution of these high resolution thought forms. I am Ryan Peverly, your master of ceremonies and purveyor of only the dankest conversational memes. And boy, do we have a dank one here for you with my man Nathan Doobie. But first, speaking of dank, we've got one of the dankest people you'd ever want to make magic with joining us to tell us about a rather magical Kickstarter campaign she's involved with right now. She's the mistress of magic, Ms. Caitlin Foise. Caitlin, way cool to have you here. Hey, thank you so much. Yeah, before we get into the Kickstarter, uh, please do give the listeners the Cliff Notes version of who you are and what it is you do. Or, you know what, I guess maybe a better question is, what exactly makes you the mistress of magic? <laughs> Well, it's a, a a term that my godfather affectionately came up with for me. It was just because it actually has a story along with it. We were walking in the park in, in Florida, and uh, there was what looked like a trapped frog. So I, I was like, let me grab this stick, and I'm going to free this frog, and this is what I'm going to do, and it's going to be amazing. And And I lifted up whatever was trapping the frog and it was a frog leg. And I was like, that thing's going to come alive. And it like kicked and like went down the stream. And my godfather was like, what just happened? He's like, you are the mistress of magic. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So that's like the short story. But in my professional life, I am an artist, a writer, uh, which, and I do a number of different things. I work in all gamuts of mixed media art and just whatever I can get my hands on. <laughs> yeah, you know, you sent me your bio uh, the other day, and I was reading through it, and I was like, holy shit. Like, you are just, it's like you're prolific and impressive. And, I mean, just tell the listeners a little bit about where you've written for, because you've got your name in some pretty major publications. Yeah, well, I've been interviewed a lot by um, different publications for my work as a curator and a witch, so... I've been in L magazine. Um, New York Times has written about me, uh, GQ Italy, and just numerous other uh, publications. I've written for Motherboard Vice that was on fear and William S. Burroughs and the frequency of fear. And I'm currently working with Billy Corgan on his new solo album. Uh, so I did a lot of the inside artwork and I did 
the t-shirt designs on that. I have a few books that are coming out uh, in the future. So one of them is Sybil's Oraculum, and that's with Tiana McQuiller. And we are we created this uh, Oracle deck together. And I also have a book coming out with Vanessa Sinclair called Chaos of the Third Mind, which comes out uh, with uh, Full Gold Limited. Awesome. Yeah, you are quite busy. And it's funny you mentioned Billy because the only thing I've read about him recently is his foray into pro wrestling, which I know he's yes. always been I know he's always been been interested in and I am a fan of the art form. I like to call it an art form as well. Uh it sounds less rednecky if you call it an art form, but form. Yeah, it yeah. Really I definitely, is. So, that's cool that he's got some new music coming out though. He does. He has a solo album coming out. It's called Ojilala, and uh, he starts tour October 13th, and that's when the album also comes out. And so we've been working on a bunch of stuff for the tour, and it's really been amazing. Like, he's an incredible person to work with and an incredible friend, and I'm very lucky to have crossed paths with him. Yeah, for sure. Now, you're in Chicago, right? Because that's where he's at. I was in New York. I lived in New York for 20 years, and then I moved to Chicago last year, and it's been amazing. I love Chicago. It's one of my favorite cities. I haven't been there in a couple of years, but God, there was a time there where I was probably... I was probably going there like probably twice a year for a handful of years. It's only about six hours from where I live. I live in southwest Ohio, so it's a quick little jaunt up through Indiana to get there. But you're really here to talk about your Kickstarter campaign, which you just launched. It's called Becoming Dangerous. This is a yeah. uh, a really interesting project. It caught my eye. You shared it on Facebook the other day, and I was like, oh, I would love to highlight this. So please do tell the listeners a little bit about the Kickstarter campaign, what the book's about, and how it came to be, I guess. Yeah, so I got an email from Katie West, and I knew Katie West from a long time ago um, through Warren Ellis, the writer, not the musician. And so we were all part of that kind of like group, and she was like, hey, I have this publishing company, Fiction and Feeling, that I started with Jamie McKelvey, and we want to do this book called um, Becoming Dangerous. And she was like, would you be interested in it? I was like, yes, absolutely. And so it's edited with um, Jasmine Elliott, and Katie is basically pulled together really brilliant women from all over the place to write about certain aspects of ritual, and ritual as resistance. And so when I heard this, I was like, wow, this is amazing. And for me as an artist, it's really love to be, lovely to be a part of this because so much of my art is this ritual or act of resistance in itself. You know, a piece of art can be a sigil. A piece of art can be, or a piece of writing can be a sigil. I mean, think about how powerful words are or how we're living in this like dystopian kind of world right now. And we're like, oh my God, I read too much Philip K. Dick. What have I done? <laughs> Um, but so with, with Katie, um, she is a really brilliant writer. She has come up with a number of different books. She did a book through fiction and feeling called split, which was all about divorce. And now this is, um, another project that's coming from that. And she is really the mastermind behind all of this. She is a brilliant person. She's a brilliant character. She's a brilliant writer. And she's the one that, Brought in Meredith Yeninos, uh, Kim Bookbinder, Lee Alexander, um, all of these brilliant women that have written for really amazing publications and all have these ritualized aspects of the art that they do. So some of the, the writing is by different artists or, you know, some people are writing about fashion as resistance and, you know, how the clothes that they wear become armor. Other people are writing about music as spells. So as they're going on tour, they're releasing these spells into the world. And sort of, you know, as people are dancing, because dancing is energy as well, you're releasing this energy and this spell work out into the world. For me, my piece is on art. It's on how I ritualize art. So a lot of times with my own art, I will say, for instance, if I painted this painting of Al Capone for a um, article I was writing, and I got cool pebbles from his home in Miami and I crushed them up and I mixed them into the paint. I mixed up a bit of like the graveyard dirt from his grave into the paint because that in itself creates a spell within the work. Some of the the goals that we have, I have my palmistry drawings and I have my physiognomy drawings in that as some of the rewards for uh, the Kickstarter. 
other people are writing about what it's like to, you know, to sort of like be a writer, what they put into their own articles, what they put into, you know, what they put out there. So each woman that is in the book is contributing a different piece of themselves, but a different ritual of resistance that they've sort of like come up with themselves. So for some of them, you know, again, it'll be like fashion for some of them, you know, one girl wrote about getting her nails done. And at first I was like, Oh, what's this? You know, like, is this like an act of resistance? And yes, because every time she looks down as these painted nails, she's looking at, you know, like this part of her that's absolutely perfect in a very flawed world. So it's a different look at what resistance can be. Can I ask what it is that you're trying to resist? Well, for me, I believe that resistance is, or beauty through resistance, you know, creating art and creating beautiful works is like the greatest act of resistance that there is, especially with what we're dealing with right now politically. I was talking to Kim Bookbinder, another person that is a contributor in this book, and we were talking about how, wow, you know, since the election, it's been really hard for us. I mean, even to like, you have happy moments, but there's still this underlying like, oh my God, what's happening here? And so for us, creating these beautiful works, and especially when, you know, you're feeling sort of like oppressed by something, having that beauty is something that can actually, you can hold on to and use that to remain strong, use that to push forward. So for me, creating art, working with artists, working with musicians, uh, Kim and I just did a show the other night in Chicago where the whole show was a ritual within itself. She got up on stage, she sang her first song, which is a spell, and it starts like, who are you, who am I? And then I read a story on ancestral curses and how to break them. And then, you know, I introduced her and then she played her set and then we closed the set as a ritual in itself. And the people there were really moved by it. So when you have these acts of beauty coming into, say, your town or your home or through a book, then you can look at these and be like, okay, so how can I be a part of this? How can I work with these people? How can I do things to help people sort of come together? And that's what this is really about. It's really about people coming together. Absolutely. I, we definitely need more of that these days. Are you familiar with Nine Inch Nails? Yes. Do you remember the album that Trent put out, gosh, it's probably 10 years ago now, called Year Zero? Yes. Okay. So you were talking and it just, you said something and it triggered, uh, to use a buzzword, it triggered a... Um, you know, kind of a memory of the marketing campaign for that album, which was very guerrilla and viral, kind of before viral was even a thing. But one of the taglines they used to promote that album, if you remember, was art is resistance. So that's exactly what we're talking about. I'm glad that you threw that out there. Nice little trip down memory lane for me. But uh, yeah, so that's really cool. So the Kickstarter is live right now. I think we only need 10,000 more. So the Kickstarter was set for $35,000 so that we could create these beautiful books filled with art and magic and ritual. And I checked it last night and I think we're, we're doing really well. (laughs) Yeah. You're at, you're at about 25,000 of your $35,000 goal with 25 days to go. Now that's as of today is Sunday, September 24th. So people will hear this a couple days from now. So it'll probably still be, you know, hopefully uh, more progress, but If not, we'll link it in the show notes. You still got 25 days left, so it looks pretty good. Yes, absolutely. We've been so amazed. I was, Katie's been updating everyone and we've been talking with her and it's just, the response to this has been so beautiful and just so overwhelming that we realize like halfway through this, like, wow, like this is so needed. And there's so many people that are, you know, at home or just being like, what can I do? And a lot of times, you know, like you think that you have to do something huge, but even creating like a small amount of like beauty or art or anything like that contributes to all of this. Everything that we do can be this act of resistance, especially when, you know, we're living in a world that does feel like a dystopian novel. (laughs) Yeah. 
It's funny you mentioned uh, Philip K. Dick earlier, too, because I'm actually talking to his last ex-wife. He was married five times, but I'm talking to Tessa Dick. It's interesting that you brought up him. I've been reading a lot of his stuff recently, too, just to, you know, kind of prepare myself for the conversation here. So it's funny, yeah, when you look back on his work specifically, the eerie nature, the the Nostradamus-like <laughs> prophecy that seems to be coming true from his quote-unquote fiction, just a cool little synchronicity there, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. Billy Corgan was the one that introduced me to Philip K. Dick. He was like, I can't believe you haven't read any of his stuff. And like, I, I think it was a few years ago and like sent me some of his books. And I was like, what, where, what rock was I under? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, yeah, he's been around for a while, but yeah. And definitely very influential on me as a, as a writer, as a thinker, as a, as a human being. So it's cool to connect with like-minded people who have similar interests and who also know the front man for the Smashing Pumpkins, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right? Anyways, so Caitlin Foyze, thanks so much for taking the time here. If people want to learn more about the Kickstarter, it will be in the show notes. But for people who want to learn more about you, where can they find you? They can find me at CaitlinFoyze.com. It's K-A-T-E-L-A-N-F-O-I-S-Y.com. Um, I'm relaunching my website at the end of October. And so that one is going to be very interactive. The one that I have right now is just sort of, here's what I'm doing. And so when it relaunches, it's going to be much more interactive. It's, It's going to be a fairy tale within itself. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see it. So, Caitlin, thanks for being here. Good luck with the Kickstarter. Good luck with uh, your work in general. And I hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. All right. Let's transition back to our featured player, Mr. Nathan Doobie. Nathan is the author of the novel A Labyrinth of Dreams, which lays the foundation for our conversation here. The book doubles as a hyper sigil and is about 18-year-old Julian Crane, who, after the murder of his grandfather, leaves the Christian faith to study occultism and the magical arts, and discovers what he calls the realm of the seven dream worlds. It's a conversation that pairs quite well with what Caitlin and I just discussed, and it caps off a nice trilogy of sorts with the two previous episodes with Dick Kahn and Ian Wilson. So let's kickstart this heart and cast this pot off into a place where the highest form of magic is and has always been art, and where that art is indeed resistance. Enjoy! Okay, so Nathan, and then your last name, is it D-U-B-E? That's correct. It's pronounced Doobie. Do- oh, that's that's fantastic. All right. <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot. I've been people, uh, I remember I was at a church youth group event when I was like 11, and these two kids came up to me. They were like 18, and they were like, is your last name really Doobie? And I was like, uh, yeah. And they were like, that's awesome. And high-fived and like took off. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on at the time. That's awesome, but yeah. It's, I've got my medical marijuana card, so it certainly uh, is a fitting name. <laughs> it's appropriate, right? Yeah. All right, man. So, Nathan, yes, doobie. <laughs> Thanks for being here, man. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me. No problem, man. I um, I don't know how we connected, but I know it had something to do with Tommy Kelly. We may talk about him a little later, but we, well, we connected because you've written a novel. It's called A Labyrinth of Dreams. It also acts... Correct. It also acts as a hyper sigil. Before we get into, you know, that magical component of your book, let's talk mm-hmm. about the compositional component of it. I've interviewed people that have written fiction, and I'm under the impression, as I think a lot of people may be by now, that a lot of fiction is autobiographical. And I'm quite sure, since you are writing a hyper sigil, I'm quite sure that your novel is no exception. So let's start Mm -hmm. here. Give us, if you don't mind, a synopsis of the book, as long or as short as you want to make it. And please, please do tell us how the story in the book, the characters in the book, how they are reflective of your own life and your own experiences. Okay, cool. So the protagonist of the book is a young man named Julian Crane. He's 18 years old, a high school student. Uh, He's a deviant. uh, So, you know, we'll breaker pension for trouble um he had a traumatic experience at uh, an earlier time in his life that is spoken through about in the book uh, which was the murder of his grandfather um the protagonist julian crane uh, was raised a christian and this um, event basically broke that belief system uh julian eventually becomes involved in occultism he discovers the use of entheogens via smoking marijuana with his friends and lucid dreaming and uh this is a large portion of the book, uh, while it does deal with altered states 
uh, the idea of gnosis, uh, things uh, of a magical component like that. Lucid dreaming is probably the main idea behind the book, and Julian discovers seven independent dream worlds, different places that exist in the subconscious human mind, kind of something akin to Young's collective unconscious, where both the souls of people who are dead and the souls of people who are dreaming can visit. Um, the people who are still living on Earth have to develop techniques to be able to act in these worlds. And each of the worlds themselves have independent magical qualities to themselves. Uh, so Julian has a run-in with a deceased friend. He does eventually reconnect with the soul of his grandfather. And I don't want to give too much of the book away because towards the end, there's um, the main part of the hyper sigil, which I'm going to leave unknown so that hopefully people will buy the book and read it. That's completely fair. I don't like it when authors of books, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, I don't like it when they come on radio shows or podcasts and just tell you everything about their book. Now, that sounds very uh, maybe capitalistic of me, like, oh, go buy this book. Yeah. But But I also feel like if I wrote a book... I want people to obviously read it. And yeah, that does mean you might have to buy it. But for me to go on a podcast or a radio show and just divulge everything about my book, like what the hell did I write it for then? Right, right. Yeah, no, I would have to agree with your sentiments. And, um, you know, I, I, I've been writing for, I don't know, maybe five or six years now. I, I wrote a lot more when I was younger, took a break from it. Uh, my main passion in life uh, for the past 20 years or so has been uh, music. I, I toured New England with a band in the uh, jam band scene up here for a while. Um, but writing was something that I reconnected with, I think, between five and seven years ago, uh, just with blogging professionally for my company, I, what I call my muggle job, my mundane nine to five life. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that led me to starting to write about occult experiences uh, on my personal blog, which is Dubious Monk's Thought Portal. I also write for disinfo.com and a lot of the content from my personal blog has been republished there. And through that, that was started by my discovery of Gordon White's blog, Rune Soup, which led me to connect with Jason Miller, who does uh, the Strategic Sorcery course, uh, which I am a student of, uh, Rufus Opus's Head for the Red blog, which is defunct now, as Rufus is a member of the OTO and has a new blog where he focuses on that work, uh, and a guy named Jack Faust, who wrote a blog called uh, Dionysian Atavism. Uh, the actual URL is von Faustus blog at blogspot.com, and... Uh, that was material that really inspired me both in a magical sense and I suppose in a fictional one as well. Yeah, so part of that first question that I asked you was how the events in the novel related to your own life and I'd like to talk a little bit about that if you don't mind. Yeah, sure, sure. So um, there is a lot of uh, uh, fiction in this book. There's also a lot of um, truth, a lot of real experiences that were basically ver verbatim taken from my life and placed into the context of the story. You know, I'm a big fan of fiction, uh, very big into Tolkien. I enjoyed uh, Lev Grossman's The Magicians series, the sci-fi TV show. And I don't think it's the greatest adaptation, but the books were very good in my opinion. I was a fan of C.S. Lewis as a kid growing up. So through that journey to, to fantasy, I eventually decided with this book, I wanted to do something similar to that. And I wanted to deliberately put a lot of myself into the characters. So in a way, Julian Crane in some respects, could be considered an analog for me. Some of the more metaphysical experiences in that are real things that happen to me in either lucid dream states or under the influence of entheogens. Some of the other events, uh, which I won't pick any specifically, are you know, things that I definitely took directly from my life and placed it in it. I used friends and family uh, to inspire some of the characters, while some of the other characters are completely fictional. So, yeah, I would say... I definitely put a large portion of myself into this book and Julian Crane can be kind of looked at as an avatar for me in, in some respects. Well, yeah, I would think he'd ha probably have to be because if you're writing it as a hyper sigil, you obviously are trying to influence your own experiences, right? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, it's part hyper sigil. It was part just sort of um, exploring my, my own history, my own past. And my experiences within occultism, tying that all together and creating a narrative that I hope, you know, at least some people connect with. And also just to explore my own mind and to hopefully interweave those things in a metaphysical manner. Part of the reason why, for example, for Disinfo, I use the name Julian Crane as my publishing name at that website. It's also what I use on Facebook. And part of using Julian Crane as a name in social media is that it's a way to harvest belief. I mean, obviously my friends and the people that I connect with who I explain that, 
you know, that's just an alias that I use online, but there are other people that I connect with. And for all they know, you know, Julian Crane is a flesh and blood human being. So in their mind, that belief kind of catalyzes the process of creating a servitor or an egregore or what have you. And that's also part of the idea of the book being a hyper sigil. Tell me a little bit about your occult practice and then how it's meshed with your use of now you're calling them entheogens i like to call them psychedelics i don't really know sure. which is preferable in this community but tell us a little bit about when you first discovered this magical world that you live in i suppose it was at the age of 14 um i growing up until that age i was very conservative kind of an outcast who you know would have preferred to have been in the popular crowd uh, and that got old quickly so I'd always had quite an imagination, and uh, I, I did a lot of art when I was younger. I drew pictures. I, I wrote short stories. I spent a lot of time in the woods as a kid. But at the age of 14, a friend introduced me to marijuana. I absolutely fell in love with it. That's around the same time I started to listening to a very diverse collection of music and starting to play music and write music and you know play out with bands myself. That eventually led to experimentations with both plant-based entheogens, such as psilocybin mushrooms, salvia divinorum, as well as synthetics like LSD, uh, MDMA, etc. And I mean, for anyone who, who's had the psychedelic experience, you know, there's a lot of uh, stuff that you just know right off the bat. If you're someone who's listening to this podcast and has never had an experience with psychedelics, it's hard to put into words. But the psychedelic experience was something that quantified one of the beliefs I was raised with as a Protestant Christian, which was that there's an unseen, invisible world. There is a spirit realm. Now, Christianity I found to be very dry and lacking, and uh, I always felt like I was looking for fireworks uh, within the context of what was supposed to be this organization run by a quote-unquote awesome God, and I was just never seeing it. And of course, being raised in that tradition, I mean, fear is a, a, a you know, the fear of hell and torment and brimstone and all that shit that's a very motivating factor and occultism was something that i used to break myself free from that belief system because i found it to be very psychologically taxing i found it to be very emotionally taxing and the psychedelic journey which eventually led me to occultism showed me uh, or at least uh, imbued a belief in me that one thing that the church seemed to get right is that there there does appear to be an unseen world now whether that is a collection of entities that are actually completely separate from you as a flesh and blood human being, or if those are incredibly powerful archetypical creatures in our subconscious minds, or a combination of both, I can't say one way or the other. I have my own beliefs, which is that it's kind of a combination of the two, but I'm still experiencing life, and who knows, maybe this is the second or third or fourth life, or maybe this is the only one we get. Again, a lot of these ideas are out of spec for yes and no, but in my experience, one thing that psychedelics did for me personally was give me some idea that, yeah, there, there is a spirit realm or something akin to that. And in the words of, I think it was Steve Jobs from Macintosh Computers, he said, one of my greatest revelations was you can pull a string over here and something else will pop out over there. And he was talking about reality. And um, I mean, that's basically the, the same revelation I got from using psychedelics, entheogens, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, and didn't Jobs, didn't he have several LSD trips, too, where he's talked fondly about those, right? Yes, yes. He was a practicing Buddhist. I'm not sure when he switched to that belief system, but he also did experiment to some degree or another with LSD and did talk fondly of his experiences. And I mean, it's funny because I grew up in that kid. So Macintosh computers have always had this kind of, I say, a user friendliness that was just a little bit more enjoyable than say the microsoft experience but it was a bit more complicated if you came from the pc side of things and then if you look at macintosh computers today they have a liquidity to them there's this really kind of um, smooth feel to the operating system and it is primarily a machine you want to buy for creative endeavors whether that's recording music or graphic design uh, digital art what have you so i kind of feel like you can see some of the side effects uh, for lack of a better word the psychedelics in Apple products, to be perfectly honest. Wow. Okay. So you're saying that like Jobs had these these psychedelic LSD trips, and then he maybe developed the operating system to sort of mimic I, that. I, I would I would say not so much in an intentional way, but I think I don't know. When I use a Mac computer, there's things that 
kind of raises my spider senses to take something out of the, the Marvel universe, if you will. It's just um, using a PC versus using a Macintosh computer. I, I, I kind of get maybe as a, not, not a direct, not an intentional effect, but uh, perhaps a subconscious side effect from those experiences that he had sort of popped up in the way that the one experiences a relationship with a Mac computer versus a PC because Macs are very geared towards the creative mind. I mean, you can certainly use them to run Excel or Microsoft Word if you wanted to, but um, they're made to do high-end, high-powered digital artwork, graphic design, sound production. And uh, I feel like there's an intrinsic link between psychedelic experience and the creation of art. So perhaps, you know, some of what Steve put into Mac computers, uh, the inspiration behind that could very well be the same inspiration that was behind certain artists' paintings or songs written or poetry, whatever, what, what have you. Well, you and I, I think, share a similar outlook on art, that it is magic. And we can talk maybe more about that in a minute. But while we're still on Apple for just a moment, can we talk a little bit about their logo and what it may symbolize? Because... I know I'm not the first one to discover this, but a couple of years ago, I just had this revelation where, shit, there's an apple, it's got a bite out yep. of it, and that has yep. to symbolize original sin, right? Yes. I've looked, I looked into a study of that a while back, probably uh, 11 to 12 years ago. I believe there is some evidence to support that. It's been a long time since I've read it. I'm not sure, but it would certainly make sense to me. And even if there was, you know, no official explanation from Apple, I feel like the logo kind of expresses that regardless of whether you get an official statement from Apple or or not. I know that um, Steve Jobs' partner, uh, Wozniak, that's his last name. I forget what his first name was, but he was... Uh, uh, Steve. Yeah, he it was, was Steve. An upper level, yeah. Steve he was an Steve. upper level... Um, <laughs> Freemason. So I wouldn't be surprised if maybe some of the esoteric ideas um, present in Freemasonry might might have affected that. Or perhaps, you know, Steve Jobs had some personal experiences where he thought, you know, Adam and Eve's apple could be symbolized and used appropriately to advertise his uh, obviously world changing products. Was their logo always an apple with a bite out of it? For some reason, I think I, I may be experiencing some sort of Mandela thing going on, because I, I, thought, I thought at first it was a whole apple, but I could be mistaken. Not that I remember. I mean, I didn't really start paying attention to computers with my own interest until maybe the age of seven or eight. And I think, let's see, I went to Macworld with my mother when I was 10. So, yeah, I, I mean, their history predates that by at least 20 years and as far as i know uh that is the original logo but you know i'm not an expert uh, on apple to be honest uh, as for its esoteric meanings i mean i would be shocked uh, if it didn't uh have some connection to the apple from the uh, garden of eden yeah that's an interesting correlation you know and i did not know that wozniak was a high-level freemason that's news to me yeah i had um i'd seen a documentary uh on I think it was Steve Jobs, maybe about two or three years ago, and there was a, a short section about his private life and Wozniak, and they showed a, a few photos of uh, Wozniak dressed up in the regalia with the the lambskin shawl, and you know he had quite a few of uh, these little pendants and badges that they collect for the degrees that they go up. I, I have several masons in my family, so I'm somewhat familiar with the symbology or at least the, you know the stuff that is available to the public or online but yes it does appear that uh wozniak is at least a mid if not upper level practicing freemason i don't know if he still is today uh, but he certainly was at one time in the past yeah man that's that's just so interesting to me you said something a few minutes ago that i wanted to circle back to you know talking about being raised christian uh were you raised catholic i thought maybe I think you put in the book that Julian, the character, was raised Catholic. Was that also how you were raised, or was it more Christian? No, um, not... I was raised Protestant, uh, primarily Baptist, evangelical churches. I went to several different ones growing up. My grandmother was Catholic. I did go to Mass with her once or twice, but both of my parents were raised Catholic and became Protestants, and they sort of are these type of Protestants that you know, uh, my mother nods to the Catholic Church and says, well, it got me, you know, on my love of Christ. And so I appreciate it for that. But it, there's some very strange things about the organization. And, you know, I'll, I'll talk to my father about this stuff because 
I mean, he's, he still is a devout Protestant Christian. He's not thrilled with the fact I became an occultist, but we talk civilly about it, and we, we both believe in the spirit realm, so we have some pretty interesting conversations. They can get a little heated at times, but for the most part, it's very civil. And um, no, as for the, in the book, Julian's father is a Protestant, and his mother, Sherry, is a Catholic. Um, both of my parents in real life the Protestants, and that's that's the tradition that I was raised in. Well, it's interesting what you said about your dad because, you know, I would think that, okay, so now I know some people are, are brought up in an environment where they're exposed to occult ideas and practices, but I would argue mm-hmm. that if you're being raised in a religious household of any sort, you're a lot closer yep. to occult ideas and practices than you think because it's all ritual. Oh, for sure. Yeah, and I mean, you know, let's take one fairly big aspect and something that's becoming, feels like it's becoming popular today, the Solomonic tradition with, you know, uh, the lesser key, the greater key, and the literature that's uh, supposedly written by King Solomon, which, you know, it's obviously not really him who wrote that material, but I mean, you know, that's it's all uh, the names of angels and demons, many of which show up in various translations of the Bible, whether it's the Protestant or the Catholic particularly Old Testament stuff, um, there's definitely correlations with that, which, I mean, I suppose I was always aware of the occult. I was definitely aware of it because there was a lot of people, even when I was growing up in church, who were paranoid and didn't want the kids in the youth group listening to rock music because of, you know, the obvious occult influence on that particular genre of music or, you know, secular music in general. Yeah, it seems that people who I've met that study or practice occultism who weren't brought up in that environment, it seems that their discovery of it is usually predated by a personal trauma of some sort. I know it was that way for me. Uh, Mm -hmm. Was it that way for you as well? Um, A personal trauma. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but, um, just as Julian did, I, I did actually lose my grandfather to a violent death. And I didn't stop believing then. Um, there was a lot of dynamics that went into my leaving of Christianity. It was actually spurned by the death of a, a very close non-Christian friend. I was this beautiful human being, my friend Joe, who was uh, a metalhead, but one of the kindest people you'd ever meet. And we, we both liked metal, and we both eventually got into the Grateful Dead. Uh, so I'm not going to ramble about the, uh, this person, but uh, the character in the, there was a character in the book that is inspired by Joe. So I guess my relationship with what I would define as a spirit realm definitely became intensified after my grandfather died. And my anger and resentment for Christianity because of the things that I started to see when I was reading the Bible myself as I got older, how ludicrous, or at least that's my personal opinion. I think it's a lot of it's completely batshit insane. I have respect for people who have faith in Christianity if they're, you know, kind and aren't judgmental. But for me personally, you know, I, I, I became very bitter for a period of time as I got up to the point where my friend Joe had died. That was, both of those events had an effect in me ultimately leaving Christianity. But my grandfather died when I was 11. Joe died four years ago. So I had started practicing magic well before I left Christianity, but uh, that event, my friend's death, definitely catalyzed a big, you know, fuck you and goodbye to Christianity and just a general acceptance of occultism, not necessarily as a spirituality or a practice, uh, but as a lens which to view the world. I suppose you could invoke uh, Robert Anton Wilson talking about the concept of reality tunnels. Uh, For the past four years, occultism has been what I look at the world through. It's my current reality tunnel. tunnel. Maybe that'll change down the road, maybe not. I enjoy uh, the perspective, and so far, I find it to be the most fluid, the most adaptable perspective that can be used for exploring one's own subconscious mind, the spirit realm, and even mundane everyday life. I would agree with that completely, man. I'm not as deep into it as you are, and definitely as a lot of other people are that probably listen to this show, to be honest. I'm, I guess what you would call an armchair occultist. I'm not, I'm not into a lot of practice. I've done a couple of magical experiments, I guess, here and there, but I really just like to read about it and research it and study it because I just want to, you know, get more familiar with the ideas. And I Mm -hmm. haven't really had any spiritual experiences recently. So it's more just been an 
almost like more of a scholarly academic interest that I want to turn into more than that. But just to tie up the point that we were just talking about, finding the occult through trauma, do you think that that's common, that a lot of people find occult study and practice after or even during traumatic experiences? I would be shocked if the answer was no. I mean, I think traumatic events kind of force you to go into a survivalist mode. Your brain kind of kicks over to a much older, more primal uh, experience when you're going through trauma. And I think, you know, the older, more primal parts of the human experience touch upon shamanism, which is ultimately the root of most, if not all, magic that exists today. Yeah, I would, I would probably leave it at that. I don't know if I can expand upon the thought much more than that. Well, why do you think the occult is so attractive to people who find themselves in these sorts of situations? I think you may have already touched on that, but if so, if you can expound on that yeah. more, that's fine. But Yeah, I think I have a pretty simple, straightforward answer for that. Uh, occultism is, I think, first and foremost about rebellion. I think when someone goes through a traumatic event in their life, it may give them the first realization that they're not invisible and that someday they're going to die. And it causes you to, you know, take stock of what's important and what is not important in life. And in this modern world, we're seeing, I don't know, I, I guess I would say I'm seeing a lot of corruption at the upper echelons of, you know, mainstream religion, corporations, business. And I think a lot of people nowadays, are, whether experiencing trauma from any of those dynamics of reality at the current time or personal traumas, whether they've experienced a physical injury or um, the loss of a friend or something to that effect or the death of a family member, magic is something that can be empowering, even if you're not good at it, so to speak. Uh, so it is something that really, I think, is actually quite approachable. I mean, you get on some magic forums or online communities and you know there's like anywhere else there's you know certainly people who are wrapped up in technical perfection or you know getting in touch with their holy guardian angel by doing the abram malin operation or you know trying to attempt to you know uh, evoke every 72 spirit of the galatia but i think ultimately what occultism and magic are about is rebellion and it's a rebellion that is for people who are suffering and who are downtrodden i suppose that doesn't necessarily mean in the context of like a geopolitical idea it can be a completely personal thing that someone is going through uh, so i would draw that back to the beginning of the conversation and talk about my experience leaving christianity i had felt like christianity had ultimately been something B bad for me. And when I left it, I was already practicing with magic because I like the idea of its practicality. There were some very simple things you can do, such as, you know, the Austin Osmond spare style of sigilization, which every chaos magician is familiar with. My personal practice borrows a lot from hoodoo. Uh, I like the idea of using physical materials to accomplish magical goals. And, you know, it's empowering. So I think magic acts as a catalyst for people uh, to find power when they need it, whether that's power to get through trauma or, you know, power to get out of a shitty situation with another human being. It's it's something that, that gives people who are in need something to grasp upon. Absolutely, man. Yeah, that was my experience. Like I said, I, I'm not too far into it. I'm still very new to it and learning about it. But I, I do see how empowering the belief systems are. But I also see how dangerous they could be as well. Have you had any experience with more of the black, dark side of it? Um, yeah, there is an article that I wrote. It's in my book, uh, it, but it's one of these experiences in the book that actually happened to me. And in the book, it's a story that's actually being written by Julian, and he shares it with a friend. And that is uh, the article uh, that, that is published on Disinfo, and is also the story that the protagonist in this book is writing. Uh, so again, this really happened to me. It's in the context of my book. This is one of those experiments in tying reality with fiction as part of creating a hyper sigil that is a fantasy novel. Uh, but anyway, what I'm talking about is the accidental invocation of Asmodeus. Uh, and this wasn't something I did when I was a practicing magician. It was an LSD experience I had around the age of, I think, 16, 17, somewhere around there. And I write in detail about it. And... I was still a Christian at the time when this happened, um, but I came to the realization that all those little drawings that you find of the 72 demons 
of the Goetia. They're just someone's interpretations at a particular time period. Demons don't take on a specific form, not in, not in my experience. And uh, I got the conviction that this was actually true uh, because after my experience, 17 years later, I, I listened to a, a podcast with Alan Moore and he talked about his experience with this demon as Asmodeus or Asmodee. He's, he's one of the 72 Goetic demons. And I was shocked by the parallels between some of the things he experienced and some of the things I experienced. But one of the things that stood out most to me, uh, which really convinced me that either the spirit I came in contact with was, in fact, this particular demon or another demon perhaps masquerading as it, was Alan's description of the demon wearing his imagination like we would wear a piece of clothing. It doesn't show up as, you know, a man or a woman or an animal flesh and blood. I mean, maybe it can. I've, I've never personally experienced that. But what Alan Moore was talking about in this podcast, what I, a lot of people that I know who practice or have experience with hallucinogens or entheogens who come in contact with, I mean, there's been people who've, who've come in contact with quote unquote celestial or good entities. Um, but my experience was definitely what I would describe as catonic or dark, perhaps even evil. But it manifests from within, from you, you come to the realization that you're interacting with something that appears to be inside your own psyche, but it has an intelligence of itself. It's hard to put these things into words uh, because some of the experiences that you have in these states of mind produce visual, physical, and psychological manifestations that defy words for the most part. But I would go back to saying that spirits, if they do exist, whether as archetypes or as external entities, it does seem that they enter through the realm of the psyche, the subconscious mind. And if a spirit takes interest in you, it comes from within and kind of projects itself out. And you experience a conversation, maybe not necessarily with words, but very strange, intense synchronicities in temperature, bodily functions, uh, thought, and uh, it's a highly personal experience, but that is what I would point to as a particularly intense, potentially dark experience with some of these things that we're discussing this evening. Yeah, and I just recorded an episode with a guy who did DMT 600 yep. times in three years and wrote a book oh, about wow. it. Well, well, he's writing a series of books about it, and he said something <laughs> similar to what you just said in terms of the entities that he was interacting with seemed like they had an intelligence of their own that, that they could exert in this space that they were sharing. Is that yeah. similar to what you were saying then? Absolutely. I, th I think, I mean, I've never actually used DMT. Uh, I know that the molecule in it or its chemical structure is similar to psilocybin, which is probably, you know, my go-to substance or was my go-to substance. And I'm sure what he experienced and I mean, if he really did it that many times over the course of that time, I'm sure he came in contact with multiple entities. But my guess is what he was attempting to describe is probably the same thing that I am attempting to describe right now. Yeah, I mean, it definitely sounds like it. So, uh, that, yeah, that's just so interesting. I've not done DMT, unfortunately. I'd love to. But I wanted to circle back to your book, to something you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation when you were describing what it was about. You mentioned that there were seven sorts of dream worlds, right? And then you also mentioned mm -hmm. that there were different techniques that the humans could use to access these worlds. Do you mind sharing, sure. uh, like maybe you don't have to share all the techniques, but what are some of the techniques that, that humans could use to access those worlds in your book? And are they the same techniques that we can use here in our waking lives? Sure. So the seven dream worlds and the interactions between human beings and those worlds in my book, that is primarily portions of the book that is fictional. But I would amend that statement by saying lucid dreaming is basically a technology. If someone was to read my book and they said, oh, my God, I wish this was real. I wish you could do it. Well, lucid dreaming basically gives you the opportunity to, to exist in any world you want. I was an adept at lucid dreaming when I was a child, and I didn't mean to do it. I didn't even know what it was because it started occurring around the age of five. By the time I realized what was happening, I, I lost the talent because I was constantly becoming aware I was dreaming. And I really discovered uh, lucid dreaming around the age of 13 or 14. Around the same time, I started smoking marijuana and subsequently reading a lot of metaphysical books. And so I just did uh, simple techniques for induction, for example, 
if you want to start experiencing lucid dreaming regularly, one thing you can do every day is just take a moment to look down at your hand and ask yourself, am I dreaming? Do that 20 to 30 times every day for a month. Eventually, you're going to start doing this in your dream. Usually, uh, when you look at your hands in a lucid dream, they distort grotesquely, quickly. Not unlike if you were to stare at your hand while you were tripping heavily on like a peak of an acid trip. Uh, so that's one way to trick your brain out of its disrealization that, that you're dreaming and take over the experience and start exploring, you know, the physical realm around you, which is really a product of your own mind. Another good thing to do is look for, I forget what the specific term is. I want to say triggers, but I don't think that's it. But usually in a, a lucid dream, there are no light sources. So if you're standing in a room and it's dimly lit and you're, you look for the light source, there won't be one. There won't be a, a lamp or a light. I don't know why that is, but I have found that that is true from my experience. Light switches don't usually work. Digital clocks will usually show a different time every time you look at them. If you do actually open a book to read, it's usually a somewhat a nauseating experience because the text morphs and changes fonts and you know it sometimes turns into just random symbols that don't have any meaning whatsoever. So if people are actually interested in having experiences, like I talk about during the dream sequences in my books, lucid dreaming will pretty much provide the entirety of any of the experiences in the book because you can, you know, once you become adept at lucid dreaming, you can do pretty much anything as long as you remain dreaming. I don't know if you're familiar with the movie Inception. Definitely, or Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio. Yeah. The idea of using an architect so that when they entered into the dream realm, the architect could actually literally build things in real time. Ellen Page, I think, played the second architect in the film. And they walk through a sequence where she basically creates a bridge out of thin air. You can do those things in lucid dreams, or at least I've developed the ability to do it. And I've, you know, I've read a lot of other people who are probably more proficient than me, this material on lucid dreaming. And if you can, if you can become conscious in dreams, you can have the most profound and probably the most intense spiritual and psychedelic experiences that you want. Uh, it is my personal belief that dreams are one of the most important spiritual technologies that humans can capitalize on. Uh, and I don't mean that in a monetary sense, but a personal sense and a way to have, quote unquote, magical experiences. Yeah, this is all syncing up really nicely here because, you know, I'd mentioned the guy I recorded with about the DMT and now you're talking about lucid dreaming. And I just recorded an episode about that as well with someone else. It's sort of like we're building a story here. We're touching on some of the same themes. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, synchronicity but, uh, yeah. at its finest. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. But let's transition away from those sorts of subjects. And I wanted to talk to you about a couple other things before we get going here. The sure. first thing is you're pretty active in the Chaos Magic group on Facebook, which is... Uh, moderated by a mutual friend of ours, Tommy Kelly, or I guess he's one of the moderators of it. He's been on the podcast before. Yeah, I have listened to that episode. It was it was good. I enjoyed it very much. Oh, yeah, thanks. Tommy's a good dude. Shout out to him if he's listening. But like Absolutely. I said, I, I see you posting in that group all the time, and I was wondering what your impressions are of the magical or the occult community that seems to be growing by the minute on social media. I mean, that Chaos Magic group, for example, is like damn near 25,000 members right now. Yeah. I'm I'm part of it. But like I said, you know, I'm still very much an armchair occultist, so I don't really contribute much right. to it. I do like to read the threads, though. Yeah. But the... Well, I mean, oh, CM, CMG has a, a unique um, initiation system, which is basically there's a lot of bullshit in CMG, but there are genuine practitioners there. I actually just did an interview with one of the members, Rob Ryder Hill, he's a student of uh, Kat Vincent and Jake Stratton Kent. He, Tommy Kelly, Alice Hart. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of people that I specifically pay attention to, but you have to pay attention. CMG is, uh, I think Tommy Kelly once uh, responded or, or described it as sort of the recess at the magical school, kind of an archetypal uh, fictional <laughs> representation of what it is. And you, yeah. you kind of got to sift through a lot to get to the people who are actually practicing. Yeah, some of the posts that pop up in my feed from people there, I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? It's a chaos magic group. Right, right. There's there's a lot of uh, strange, odd, and completely non-occult related shit that goes on there. But there is at least, I'd say, in my experience, about half a dozen people that I personally pay attention to who, if they post something, I'm going to go to the link. I'm going to read the post. Um, I mean, Kat Vincent, I don't know him terribly well. We've spoken on the phone a couple times and I chat with him online. 
you know, he's he, he's a, a veteran. I don't know if I'd limit him to chaos magician, but he ran a, a magical service company uh, for 10 years, literally doing that for a living. So he would be a good example of one of the people to keep an eye out for, uh, who knows what the fuck they're doing, who's, who's, you know, doing magical practices that does seem to have traceable effects in reality um, with sources that you can um, go back and review yourself. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I heard him on Rune Soup. Oh, I was probably a, a year or so ago. He's a pretty interesting cat, <laughs> to, to use a pun. But, <laughs> yes. Um, yes, yes. But the reason I brought up the Chaos Magic Facebook group was because occult practice seems to be quite solitary. Uh, it doesn't really lend right. itself to a lot of social interaction. Now, granted, you did describe it as like recess from that, probably. But yeah. I still want to ask this question. I wonder if socializing magic or the occult, spotlighting it, if that doesn't sort of take away from from its power. For example, if you were a Christian and you prayed to God every night, you know, that's your ritual practice, right? But you're not yeah. divulging the content of your prayers on Facebook. I see a lot of people saying, and not necessarily in this group, but, you know, online in yeah. general, I see a lot of people talking about what they're sigiling or what they're trying to conjure. And I wonder if that doesn't take right. away from the power of the practice itself. Do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. I, I've often considered the very same things you're bringing up now myself. I think it can go either way. I think it's probably a case sensitive issue. I'm sure there are times when it's, you know, a detriment to real progress in an occult practice and other times where there are uh, to steal a line from the Bible, um, uh, I've got to, I'm not exactly sure what the verse is, but it talks about not casting your pearls before swine. I mean, uh, there's a specific idea I'm going for here. Somebody, I, I want to say it might have been Thomas Jefferson, of all people, uh, talked about the, the Bible saying, you know, it's basically a smoking dung heap, but there are pearls of wisdom within that heap, and digging through the bullshit is worth it to get the gems of truth. CMG is exactly the same way, and as far as what you're talking about being detrimental to the uh, maybe the spells or enchantments or sigils actually working. Again, it's case sensitive. I mean, some of those people are probably getting attention, energy, belief, whatever, charging some of what they're doing and maybe having a positive effect where other people's practice, depending upon what the particular dynamics are in whichever system of magic they're doing and whichever type of enchantment they're doing may in fact be detrimental. But again, it's going to be case sensitive. And I can't really say one way or the other if the group as a whole is, you know, going one way or the other. All I know is that I found people that I like in that community and by interacting with them and experimenting with them, I found to get some effects uh, in my own personal life that seemed to make it a worthwhile endeavor in a, in a group to peruse and make friends with. Here's the exact quote from Thomas Jefferson, because I actually pulled it out of one of your blog entries and put it in my notes. So it was going to come oh, up eventually. It, it, it was, <laughs> Thanks for reading. I appreciate it. <laughs> I was going to say, it was going to come up eventually, maybe. But the actual quote is that the Bible is primarily a dung heap of which the seeker must dig through to extract the diamonds of wisdom and truth. And that's it. your personal comment on that is that really gets to the heart of what I think the human experience is all about. And that's definitely been my experience is there's a lot of bullshit that you have to sort through to get to the good stuff. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I uh, I went through a a very hateful stage towards Christianity when I left it. Um, I did a very simple ritual in leaving it. You know, a lot of people pick up Paul Hewson's Mastering Witchcraft and they begin their journey by saying the Lord's Prayer backwards and lighting a candle every night for three nights. And I, I've read stories from people who read that book in the 70s and some of them got real freaked out and had some strange shit. Um, and I didn't I've read that book and I've experimented a little bit with some of the tech in it. But when I left Christianity, one of the most you know, it, I call it a ritual. Um, it's very simple. I took the, the Bible that my parents had given me. I walked outside, I put it in my fire pit, I doused it in gasoline, lit the thing on fire and pissed out the ashes. And I immediately came in the house and listened to the song Judith by a perfect circle. And it was one of the most liberating experiences I had ever had. Now, a lot of people would look at that and say, well, that's not magic. I mean, where's, you know, where's the demons? Where's the angels? Where's, you know, where's the fireworks? But it, it was a simple, perhaps mundane ritual inspired by a lot of my activities in occultism. And it severed a huge weight off of my shoulders and kind of gave me a fresh perspective on why I had started 
doing magic in the first place and where I was going to go from there, which is basically just an ongoing experiment in creativity. Cause I do think magic is more of an art than a science, but there are times uh, in your personal experiences, if you give enough time, energy and experience to magic, there are times when things connect and the dots just click and there's something to it. I'm, I'm by no means an expert. Um, you know, I've only been practicing diligently for maybe the, the past four or five years now. Um, I read for 10 years before I, I started messing with things because honestly, there was a level of fear, probably from uh, my Christian upbringing. I feel like the fear might be unfounded sometimes, but there's probably times where it's definitely founded. And, you know, the occult does have some <laughs> levels of danger to it. You you can get involved in things and synchronicities can start causing very uncomfortable situations for you. I just went off on a tangent. I apologize. I kind of lost the uh, the initial uh, theme we were discussing. Well, so did I, but we don't apologize for tangents here, so it's totally cool. All right. I did want to ask you, too, because it's something that you've written about that I have an interest in that I haven't been able to talk to anybody about yet, but you've written a couple blog entries about egregores, mm -hmm. and that's a topic that I, again, am new to in the past couple of years, you know, since I started my own occult studying here, but... I was wondering if you could tell the listeners a little bit about the occult concept that is the egregore and how we actually all have interacted with it at one point or another in our lives. Well, sure. All right. So an egregore, uh, a paraphrased description would be an artificial psychic entity, which is created and sustained by the group of people who believe in it. So if we back up and, you know, take that in for a second, what's an example of an egregore? I oftentimes like to point to Santa Claus uh, around Christmas time because it's, the most easy example of an egregore for people who are unfamiliar with it to digest. Whether or not Santa Claus actually existed, I mean, I know there was a, a, a literal St. Nicholas, but the Santa Claus of corporate America and the Santa Claus that a lot of children are giving their imagination, time, and energy to throughout the year is an artificial psychic entity. Whether or not that thing has sentience yet, I don't know, as, you know, it's a complicated uh, concept, but everybody does interact with these things, like you say. And the, the mundane version of an egregore would be the corporation. Uh, a large corporation is composed of, you know, hundreds, thousands, or millions of individual people who give, you know, 40 hours a week or more of their most intense time, focus, and energy. And that energy becomes something. That something is a corporation, like Nike. That something is a an imaginary character, like in a perhaps more positive sense, Santa Claus, or maybe a cartoon character. In a darker sense, something like Slender Man, um, which has very negative, bad, violent, real effects uh, in our world. Th these, are, these are a few different examples of what egregores are, both on the mundane and occult side of perspective. Are egregores and tulpas the same thing, then? I would say no. I haven't studied uh, the phenomenon of tulpas enough to comment in, on it, to be perfectly honest. There are certainly some similarities. Um, tulpas, I think, are specifically sentient beings that are an intelligence uh, in and of themselves separately. How exactly that works, um, again, I, I'm, I don't have enough personal experience or study on that particular topic to comment much further than that. Well, that's totally cool, man. The last thing I wanted to wrap up on here was your music. Because, you know, we've been talking about magic, we've been talking about art, I guess, you know, here and there as well. And I see music as maybe the highest form of art because it does have that ritualistic component to it. It has that, especially if you're talking about live music, that, that shamanistic component to it. Do you see right. that in the same way that I do, that as I just described it, or do you see yes, it different? It's, it's hard. It's yeah, I absolutely do. It's hard for me to separate music and magic. I would say that you know music is a type of magic. I mean, some people would say that it's the highest type of magic. Uh, now, you know, a staunch occultist who is not a musician would highly disagree with that. So I'm not here to say who's right and who's wrong. I'm, but I would agree with your sentiments and my own experience. I mean, particularly if you know you're doing things in a setting where people are using mind-altering substances. I, I had the good fortune to tour with my band around New England. We've been together for about 11 years. We're, we only play a couple times a year now, but 
four or five years ago, we were touring all over New England regularly, and we, we toured in the jam band scene, uh, festivals like uh, Strange Creek, Wormtown Music Festival, Disc Jam Music Festival. We played the first two of those, which are, all of those are really big festivals in the Northeast during uh, the music festival season. And, you know, those communities of people, which are, you know, primarily hippies, for, for lack of a better term, uh, a lot of people there go to see these events and interact with the band and dance under the influence of uh, hallucinogens, psychedelics. I'd say about 90% of the people at these events are probably smoking weed and or consuming alcohol throughout you know, the three-day experience. Uh, so the things that happen in, in front of a crowd like that, if you're partaking in the substances or not, once you get going, once you get in the groove, both literally and figuratively, magic happens things change. You literally change the universe for a period of time. Now, maybe that change is just going on collectively in the minds of people who are there at the moment and a little egregore is born and you kind of become enraptured with that tiny god while it exists until the music stops and it disappears. It could be a completely subjective experience. It could actually birth major changes in the world. I don't know, but the, the practice of performing live music, even if substance isn't involved, that the band who is basically standing on a, a gigantic altar, the stage, if the connection with the audience induces an intense emotional reaction, there are things that happen in the context of that experience that I would say parallel things that happen in the Solomonic Circle or in a, a ritual uh, area, event, temple, what have you, or you know your own makeshift altar at your house in your basement or wherever you have one in your home. Again, all subject subjective experiences, but Music is absolutely, uh, in and of itself, a form of magic, and um, taking part or enjoying music definitely parallels experiences in taking part or enjoying occultism. Yeah, and I may look at it in a, a bit of a different, maybe more scientific way, too. Like, you know, if the universe, which I do like this idea that the universe is made of frequency and vibration and sound. So right. if that's... Go ahead. And those, you know, those are very old hermetic ideas as well. Right. So, so, uh, so I didn't want to cut you off there. No, no, no. It's totally cool. But I was just going to say, if that is the case, then if you can command sound, and when you do that, you know, by creating your own via music, right? And you, you mm -hmm. are, you are commanding that universal space and that universal energy in that moment. Right. I mean, for me, it's less of a commanding. I mean, there are certainly times. You know, I've played shows um, with my band and I've had the great opportunity to have these phenomenal experiences in, in front of crowds of at least a couple hundred people. And, you know, it, it transcends the, the mundane aspects of what's going on and becomes a spiritual event. After that, again, I lost my train of thought. Sorry about that. Well, you said it becomes a spiritual experience, a spiritual event. And after that, something yeah, I, I, you know, sometimes okay. I get on tangents when I'm really <laughs> thinking deeply and passionately about something and I, <laughs> the, the train keeps going and I'm left there sitting next to the tracks. Hey, it happens to the best of us, man. So no worries. Yeah, but fair, fair enough. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's a good note to wrap up on then, man. Please do tell people where they can find your book, where they can find your blog, and if they want to keep up with you anywhere else. Okay, cool. So my main website is nathandubie.net. That's N-A-T-H-A-N-D-U-B-E.net. That has a link to my blog, Dubious Monk's Thought Portal. I write under the alias of Julian Crane on disinfo.com. My Twitter handle is Dubious Monk. And you can purchase my book if you're interested in reading it at smashwords.com, Barnes & Noble Booksellers. Uh, and there's a whole slew of other major and minor digital booksellers that you can buy it. But if you just Google A Labyrinth of Dreams by Nathan Doobie, you'll get the first of uh, 10 results are all links to my book. That's awesome, man. I do appreciate your time. I appreciate you being here. I'd love to chat with you again sometime. Yeah, I, I certainly hope to, to chat again. I, you know, I do very much enjoy talking about occultism, psychedelics, uh, spirituality, religion, and so on and so forth with like-minded people. So thank you very much for the opportunity. No problem, man. We'll have to do it again soon, all right? For sure. Take care, and I'll, I'll talk to you soon. All right. Have a good night. Bye-bye now. All right. There you have it. My thanks again to Nathan Doobie. There are a slew of links in the show notes to his work and some of the other things we mentioned as well. Please do give him a look if you feel so inclined. And another thank you to Caitlin Foise for joining me in the intro to talk a bit about Becoming Dangerous. The link to that Kickstarter is also in the show notes. 
And I got to tell you, these are the types of conversations that I think are becoming the backbone of this podcast. Art is indeed magic, that high magic, capital H, capital M. And art really is one of the best forms of resistance, maybe the best, that we have against all this noise and bullshit being thrown at us every day. I mean, think about it. How powerful is a good book or a good film? These artworks stick with us for lifetimes. Our favorite stories follow us throughout our life and become part of us. We speak to each other in quotes and snippets from these stories. How powerful is a painting? Have you ever sat and just lost yourself in a piece of art in a gallery and just thought, my God, this says so much in a small amount of space and without words, no less. Don't even get me started on music and how powerful that is. I've laughed and cried many times to many different songs, and I always get so moved when I hear live music. It's one of the best experiences that we can share with ourselves and with others. And for fuck's sake, let's take back our culture already. Let's take it back from the people who think it's their responsibility to create it for us. Aren't we tired of the same old stories and the same old characters? Aren't we tired of remakes and sequels and meaningless song lyrics and mind-numbing musicianship? Let's take back our art, all right? Let's take back our stories and our music, and let's create something new while we're at it. Let's recast this play with characters who better represent us, and let's re-sculpt this world in an image that better defines us. Let's continue to resist, but let's make sure we're resisting the right things for the right reasons in the right ways. Let's not trip up on party lines. Let's forget nationalism and tribalism. Let's not give in to these fear tactics. Let's remember that both wings are attached to the same bird and that choosing one of those wings over the other is not resistance. That's walking yourself right into a hornet's nest where... Instead of allowing yourself to focus on the one issue that really matters, you instead find yourself stuck in a spot where you're swatting away a hundred issues that don't matter. In other words, resist with discernment. Turn off your TV. Stop tweeting and gramming and snapping and Facebooking all day. Stop giving up your privacy so people can see where you're at and what you're doing. Stop spending your time paying attention to meaningless bullshit because they're coming for all of it anyway. And if you think I'm fucking around here, look how involved the NFL is now with this political theater. It's sad that most people in this country get butt hurt over athletes disrespecting a flag or a song, but those same people don't seem to care about their own civil liberties being slowly pried away from them. It's a massive distraction from what's really going on here, and you don't know, or I guess you can't know, what's really going on if you're constantly distracted. I'll tell you what we do know, though. We know we're in the middle of the suck when we can't even watch a football game without being exposed to this noise. So quiet it down. Disconnect from it. Rise above it. Resist it. And resist it with your art. Resist it with your magic. And resist it with your love. Anyway, speaking of love, man, do I love this time of year. Autumn has always been my favorite season, and that seasonal change can only mean one thing. Uh, No, not the silly football games, but Halloween right around the corner. We take Halloween pretty, pretty, pretty seriously around these parts. So seriously that we're celebrating all October with a variety of guests and episodes and a little something we call Trap or Treat. It's sort of a throwback to the early episodes of this show. It's the second year we've done it. If you've been with me since the beginning, you know what's coming. But if you're new around these parts, well, I hope you don't mind dancing your ass off. But it's bigger and it's better than last year's. And I hope you guys hit that subscribe button and come back and hang out with us for what I think is going to be a hell of a month of shows. And hey, if you liked what you heard here today and want to contribute to this resistance... Please do consider supporting the show in whatever way you can. I mentioned hitting the subscribe button just a second ago. Do that in your favorite podcast app. Do it on YouTube. Do it on SoundCloud. We're even on Vimeo. Getting a VidMe set up too because something tells me I'm not going to be on YouTube much longer. You can also leave the show a five-star review on iTunes if you're listening through an Apple device. And of course, donate some spare change to help make this show better by visiting oldculturepodcast.com slash support and choosing one of our three donation options. Monthly recurring through PayPal, single donation through PayPal, single donation through Bitcoin, 
your choice, your call. However you can contribute, five-star review, $5 donation, it is all appreciated. And with that, I gotta get out of here. Until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.